looking at the landscape, uh, Parentos, all around the world, and work with a lot of different companies. What are you seeing as the most promising areas right now for investment in the seafood sector? Um, no, I think um, we have to go back one step and, and then um, look at what, what what has been some of the, one of the key themes. Uh, that is that aquaculture will, will grow. Um, but seafood, uh, seafood demand is increasing, uh, while stocks are staying uh, flat, and, and uh, we need to grow aquaculture uh, in order to, to supply the world uh, with, with fish. Um, however, uh, in order to do this, uh, the aquaculture sector like globally needs to industrialize. It, it is the, the least industrialized uh, protein sector among the larger protein uh, sources. Um, and in order to, to get the growth that is needed, um, uh, we, we cannot only rely on salmon, we only need to rely on also uh, other species, other larger species. Um, so, um, um, so there we will see uh, industrialization. Uh, so, in terms of them finding the, the interesting um, areas for investment, this is the companies which will will be part of driving that industrialization. And then that, that, that they can maybe look to look to salmon, which companies are important for in the salmon um, um, <laughs> call it supplier technology uh, part today and then also for all other areas. And, so um, and we have had say have so many companies here today. We have we have Aqua Group, we have Benchmark, uh, you had uh, uh, Biomar, which uh, comes from salmon, which is uh, which is uh, in, which is uh, supplying feed to more and more species. So um, I think there is a lot of things which will happen over the next decade, uh, so, and, and, uh, and companies which are positioned to to drive uh, that development. Uh, that will for sure be good investments. Well, we spend a lot of time on aquaculture and salmon in particular, but uh, one of the great things about having Jeff here with us is Jeff. Um, you've spent the majority of your career in the wild fish sector. Um, so tell us a little bit about beyond salmon when you're looking into the, the, wild, uh, the wild segment uh, and the work that you did with Blue Harvest and discovering some of these quote unquote hidden fisheries. So where are the opportunities in, in wild fisheries and what does it take to manage those types of investments because that's right in the name, they're wild, right? So um, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, it's uh, today we've heard a lot about the agriculture industry and, and the opportunities there. I think there's tremendous opportunities in that area. But when I go back to the wild harvest fisheries, um, one of the areas that we've invested heavily in in the past and continue to invest in is because we feel if you can get into a fishery that has property rights, long-term value of that fishery will continue to grow. Uh, supply is capped, as we've all learned. So therefore, the demand keeps going up. The, the value of that, of that uh, harvest keeps going up. And if you can get into a fishery that's well managed, um, sustainable, we believe that that's a good spot to be. And that's what we've invested in the past, and I would continue to invest in those areas. But you have to search. There, there are niche markets out there. You have to understand the regulatory environment you're entering into. You need to understand um, the volatility of the fisheries that you're going to be involved with and what pricing around the world and world markets um, will, will affect that going forward. We do believe strongly that um, there are still a lot of opportunities out there. Um, there are some markets, like if you look at the west coast of the United States, these, there are still some opportunities, but pricing is high when you look at those on, on a per ton quota base, the value of those species. Um, where if you look on the east coast of the United States, we spent a lot of our time and saw a lot of opportunities. I think there's still a lot of opportunities in markets like South America, um, where there's a chance to go back in and rebuild some of these wild fisheries. And as there, uh, there's more stability into those markets, I think there's some great opportunity for growth there as well. So, in, in terms of private equity coming into uh, the wild fish uh, segment, um, what does it take to articulate to them the risks and challenges of coming into, uh, into a sector that fluctuates the way that it does? And how did, although Brigal has people that are experienced in this sector, how then will other private equity companies need to approach the wild harvest sector in particular? 
Well, you have, again, you have to understand that the fisheries, each fishery is very different, and each regulatory environment for each fishery is very different. You need to understand that when you go into it. Um, generally, when we look at the harvest side of the business, you're looking at putting a lot of capital up front to buy your licenses, buy your rights into the fisheries, but then you generate a lot of cash from that. It, it's, uh, margins are generally pretty good on the harvest sector in most fisheries, but particularly if, it, if it's a limited access fishery. Um, when you start moving downstream from that, you, better, you need to understand it much more, uh, what's going to happen. And I think this is where the equity firms may have a little bit more problem, is trying to look at very tight cash flow models. It's very difficult as you move, and you're the interpreter, as I would call it, from the wild harvest part of the fishery to the market part of the fishery. Someone has to be the, the buffer in that, and the minute you move into the processing sector, you become that, that buffer. And that's a very hard one because you need to really understand the cycles of the, of the wild harvest to what the market cycles are going to be, and they're not necessarily the same. So, Shetra, your group's taking sort of a different approach in terms of, uh, in terms of the aquaculture and seafood sector. You've seen the opportunities on the input and equipment side. So tell us, where are those opportunities uh, and where are the most exciting things happening on that side of things? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I think it's very important when we discuss the agriculture sector in particular to understand that it's in a very early phase, very kind of the beginning, like uh, Christopher was, was mentioning, and, and we need growth. Uh, of course, it's what we need to, to uh, to that sector and to get that growth we need more sustainable technologies that was also mentioned uh, a few times here today so to, to look at technologies that can be environmental friendly so we can convince government uh, convince institutions to, to, to give us that growth um, and maybe ROS uh, and, uh, and technologies around ROS I feel is a very good example on how we can take a sustainable technology and, uh, and give us that growth. And I think the, the flip side of, of that growth is that it will push the farmers uh, which use a more traditional model uh, in seed cages to also develop uh, further. So we, uh, we of course made an investment into, in, into, into recyclation systems uh, with our investment in, in Bilun. Uh, and we are looking at several uh, suppliers now uh, which have exposure, uh, exposure to uh, that part of the industry. So all types of like wastewater treatment, uh, water systems uh, and different technologies on the filter side. And biofilter was mentioned here uh, today as a very important thing and that's a very interesting area for us. So Dawid, you're, you're coming from a broader agribusiness sector, so you've got a much, uh, a much broader view on things. Um, coming into the sector, looking around and identifying uh, the investments, uh, the investment opportunities, where do you see as places that maybe are um, under consolidated or that may hold opportunities that aren't yet capitalized on? I think, uh, you know, Kind of areas of consolidation, and we, we sort of had some presentations earlier. I think that some of the regions where you can see consolidation is obviously in Chile. Um, and I think the, the, the country needs consolidation. I think it will be good for the industry as well. I think, um, you know, also probably higher up in the, in the supply chain, in the fish movie industry, I'm expecting consolidation there. Um, but, but also, I think. Um, in terms of opportunities, well, probably not, you know, consolidation, but opportunities. Um, I see. I see at the moment, obviously, the the farmers are making very good money. So that uh, that sort of second order derivative for us is really the input providers that that's going to start enjoying good pricing power. Um, some of them, I think, are enjoying uh, enjoying pricing power already, but I think that could could stall. Um, you know, still, still improve. So, so someone like a solution provider, you know, a company like Benchmark, I think has got tremendous opportunity in front of them as well. Um, and I think, um, you know, if you then move slightly further down the, the value chain or the supply chain, um, 
you know, there's opportunity, I think, in branding as well. I think some of the, the, the farmers have obviously attempted this and haven't really succeeded. But, but I think if you can, can uh, get a good branding strategy going, um, you know, and maybe collaborating with e-commerce and that side of things, um, you know, th 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 there's big opportunity in distribution and, and branding in my view as well. So Christopher, beyond Cook, uh, I think Cook is probably the most diversified seafood company that there is. Uh, and, and looking at Mr. Buck's presentation, um, you can see that they've been slow and steady in their expansion, and yet their choices have been very diverse, both by sector and by region. Why haven't more companies pursued that strategy, and do you think it's the right one? Yeah, what is the right one? I think it for for Cook it, it has definitely been the right one, and I think it's in. Uh, um, I think Peter gave an impressive presentation about the development of the company, how, how they have gone from where they were back in before 2005 and then up to today. And uh, it's going to be exciting to see uh, how that will be going forward. Um, however, that kind of strategy, it, it, it uh, takes uh, ambitions and uh, I think there, there's not that many companies which are, are, have, have such a uh, Call it large, large uh, which I have now are such uh, aggressive. Um, so, um, but if, if for why companies have to done, I don't know why they would have not done the same thing. Um, uh, looking at the salmon farmers, that they have been call it, uh, successfully focused on um, on uh, call it the, the production part there, where, where they have uh, uh, earned the most value of take. You have some some salmon farmers which have. Well, it widened in, in the value chain, uh, for example, in the harvest, uh, you know, Baca Frost will also go, go into to, to, to the feed, uh, feed side, so, um, so I, but I, I don't have any clear answer why people have done it. So it's, uh, well, Jeff, I mean, you've worked in both segments and both sectors. Um, is, it, is it kind of naive from the outside perspective to think, oh yeah, this, you look at this, the industry and say, ah, if we just put these all together, we'd have a perfect value chain. Um, is that the way people should be uh, looking or should people really be specializing, like Christopher just said, in doing what they do well? well I think it, it really depends on the ownership structures in many cases. Um, it's interesting, I think, if you look around the fisheries and you look at successful companies like Cook, Trident, they tend to be family-owned businesses where they take a very long look at where they're going. And those companies can get very vertical and go very wide because of that. They're not sitting there having to show performance every quarter. Um, I think if you're a public company or you're working with a private equity firm, it's a little bit more difficult to go that way because the risks are greater. It's harder to become an expert in everything overnight. Um, but I, so my feeling would be that when I look at it, um, I think if you're on the market side of the business, you have to be broad in what you bring to the market. And those companies can be very public, but they're staying more towards that side of the part of the business, staying to the market on and not so much owning the resource side. When you're tied into the resource and trying to get to the market, um, it's a little bit more difficult because they are moving around, those pieces move around very rapidly. And even the cap structure of the business is very different, like what you require for a um, you know a resource-based business as opposed to what you need for, for the market side of the business. So Chantal, uh, tell us a bit about investor timeline. Um, compared to the, the traditional private equity timeline, the seafood sector is fluctuates significantly. So when Broodstock goes into investments, how far ahead are you looking in terms of, of, uh, of timeline? Uh, it's, it's actually a very good, uh, good question because like if, if you go back to the fact that I believe this is in a very early phase, we see a lot of technology companies coming in uh, with a new technology that the market loves and it goes like one year or two years uh, and no one is using it anymore. Uh, so it's, it's very hard in terms of especially technology to, to kind of make the right bet. Um, so from, from our perspective, we always try to, to build a business model which can can typically expand to seven years. 
uh, we, have, we have also make sure in, in our case that we have a structure that can uh, make us hold the company for longer time uh, if it's um, if it's valuable because that it is very hard because it changes so much over time and uh, and we have seen companies that that reduce their revenue of 50 percent year over year uh, just the changes in dynamics when I'm at the farm or uh, visiting a farmer I see uh, he changed his methods just from one day to another he's trying different things so so in terms of perspective it's very hard to make the right pick and, and, and pick the companies that will grow over time uh, and uh, the typical we do uh, as every other company and uh, private equity company has a kind of time horizon that we believe in but uh, as you said like in this industry everything is changing so fast so it's extremely hard to, to be right are you seeing, I mean, with, with the investments in the input sector, are you seeing um, an upwelling of new technology that's actually going to continue to drive on that input side and drive profitability in the aquaculture sector? Yeah, I, I see a lot every day. There's, there's so many ideas out there and, and there's so many uh, different, uh, different opportunities if you want to get in. Uh, but again, it's very hard to, to and you need strong industry knowledge to, to actually be be right, and you have to be very thorough in your in your process, and, and talk to a lot of players in the industry because everything changes so fast. I, I talk to the big farmers, and they have different strategy, different regions, uh, different strategy, and different countries, uh, and, and 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 things change so rapidly. So it's hard. And in and addition, there is a lot of people talking about consolidation in this industry, and 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 I feel that. A lot of the companies are very immature in terms of managerial capacity, uh, culture, and actually the ability to extract value from, from a merger or an acquisition is, is very hard. And, uh, and uh, kind of, for a lot of these companies, they actually had uh, so much work to do internally. So when I see a new technology and I feel like this could be a perfect match for one of our portfolio companies, and I look at the management setup and, and the, the the, the work that needs to be done inside a company, I say like we just have to focus on our core. Uh, there's so much to do, uh, so many opportunities inside the company that we can do all these technology events at the same time. I see you're nodding your head, Jeff, and I, I think that's one of the that's one of the main issues in the seafood industry, right? It's bringing number one, bringing new people into the sector. Full stop. That's a, uh, an issue. But even more challenging is we make this transition and start to bring in uh, professional management because certainly the Shetel says need to professionalize on the management side. We have this other problem, which is many of the CEOs still in this industry probably started with rubber boots on. They probably started off on a boat or a farm. So how then does that knowledge get transferred uh, on the executive level from being close to the source, close to a highly complicated sector, and yet marrying it with that uh, management uh, expertise? Yeah. It's a challenge. Um, as we've watched our businesses grow, bringing in experts and, and, and attracting young people to the, to the industry is not easy because it's not a pretty industry. Um, I think agriculture may actually be a little bit more sexy than, than the wild harvest part of it. And particularly the processing side, it's, it's a very difficult place to, to develop talent. Um, but one thing that we always look at and we tell people that come into this industry is that it's an exciting industry because it's actually a very international business. And so it does present a lot of opportunities. But the transition, and when we've seen it a lot in our sector, with most of the companies we purchase are family-owned businesses. And this is very difficult. You're taking them from someone who owned a boat, uh, started out as a fisherman, son may have become a fisherman, or, or other family members are part of the, of the company. And you're now trying to come in and prevent and, and build a, pro, a professional organization over that. It's a very difficult transition, and that cultural change is something you've got to manage very carefully. Don't underestimate the effects of that when you're going in there. Um, and I think as a CEO that has had to do that, I, I'm riding two, two rails, trying, trying to keep a balance on that. You don't want to lose the knowledge that, the historical knowledge that's in that, that company that you purchased, but at the same time, your job is to move it to a different level. And so transitioning that business is a very hard part of it. But it can be done. It takes time. It takes patience. And you've really got to make your calls for
very carefully because, um, as I say, you don't want to lose your institutional knowledge, but at the same time, that can become something that restricts you from growth because making change in, open, in small companies is very hard to do. So, Dawid, comparing this. Can I just say, oh, sure. Uh, because I, I totally agree on that and I experienced that a lot, and I think that's it's an important element to consider when we think about how this industry will develop because this is a factor that will uh, make a lot of the changes go a little bit slower than we probably want it to do. And, and I think like in terms of the growth and in terms of um, uh, starting to use new technology, we're kind of working so hard just to get a company or a founder or you know, to change the management. So it's sort of like, why jump on new technologies at the same time? Like there's so, so much to, to fix. Right. Especially when there's you know a lot of profit to be made, it's why fix what isn't broken. I guess can be the, the thinking. So now we're just taking a look at the sort of the broader agribusiness sector, um, and you've watched other proteins and the channels that they've taken, and certainly they're years ahead of where seafood is. Where do you think seafood uh, needs to be looking in terms of consolidation? What areas tend to need to be consolidated when you bring it down to a smaller set of, of companies? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, well, you know, we're, we're, we can only really invest in listed companies, um, you know, in my team at Investec, and, and so we would love to see more, um, you know, consolidation in, uh, you know, basically in the providers, so probably on the equipment side, on the feed side of things, but also the then on the processing, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, and perhaps on the branding side, I don't know if you can call it consolidation that's going to happen on the branding side, but it's kind of innovation that's need needed on the branding side, I think. Um, you know, at the moment, the sort of pools of liquidity really is in farm and, um, and some, some sort of ancillary areas around that. And we'd love to get, um, you know, get exposure to other areas, you know, be it the sort of input providers, you know, equipment feed and others, um, and you know, and the processing and the kind of offtake, um, and then other species as well. I mean, I'd love to be able to to get exposure to a list of tilapia kind of a pure play over time. I think it's going to take, you know, probably take a while to get there, but um, with some of the advances, um, you know, on the land-based farming side, it sounds like it's, you know, it is in the making. So Christopher, setting aside salmon because it sort of lives in a different world, um, what other species uh, do you feel are ripe for that same journey that salmon has gone on in terms of, uh, of innovation, in terms of uh, stability, in terms of uh, fish health, uh, genetics, all of that? So uh, we can start with, uh, I think, um, sea brim and sea bass uh, is maybe the, the first species which will go through uh, that development. Uh, I think what you, you, you have already seen uh, called after Amaranth and after Meada, but then they already done, done an interesting message there. Uh, now that the, the Greek um, in, to call it, it is will be more consolidated uh, with Sir Ando Nereus now hopefully soon be, being uh, finding a new, new owner, maybe that's, that will be how on the so so that there, I think you will, will see things going quite soon. Um, and then looking a bit further down the road, uh, I think uh, you, they will see things in shrimp. Um, you you have uh, well, it's shrimp is is a very fragmented industry, but mostly in the big uh, farm in developing countries. But, but there are some some groups which which are call it focusing. On this in a more professional way, trying to to get um, integrate more more industrialized uh, farming practices. Uh, you saw this morning, Sea uh, Farmers Group in Australia announced that the Sea the Sui um, has gone to invest invest um, that company. Um, that, that, that's 25 million Australian dollars, but uh, the capital needed that project is, is much higher. They they have gone into to, to construct a large farming operation in the northern, uh, northern part of Australia, which is, well, to date, there's nothing there. So, it, 
because it's a quite interesting project. And uh, we don't also have all, all other companies uh, which are called, uh, trying to do to do, um, to do, um, farm shrimp in a more more uh, sustainable way. You know. So, so that, that's RIP, uh, and, and the third lab they will say tilapia. Uh, we, 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 um, they're also quite a very fragmented industry. You have called it one large group uh, with Re Regal Springs, which is, uh, is already doing um, call it, uh, quite good and quite different compared to the, to the wider industry. Uh, but at the same time, you, you see a lot of things happening in Brazil. You see some of the large uh, cooperatives and all product players that are focusing more on, on uh, the tilapia uh, industry there. Uh, um, and, and I think both in, in shrimp and, and, uh, and tilapia, uh, we heard benchmark over today about what they are doing there in the genetic side, uh, which is important to, to make those industries prosper more. Uh, you also see that uh, Aqua again, or their owner, is uh, taking a more strategic focus on, on tilapia. So, um, yeah, so I think that those three, three uh, species of that I think we will we'll see things uh, happen for the next. Yes. Jeff, how about on the wild, uh, wild fish side? I mean, you were kind of able to identify an opportunity in scallops that maybe others didn't see. Um, what else is out there in terms of consolidating uh, either in the white fish or, or other sectors um, that, uh, that could be a good place for investors? It's hard. You have to really, you know, I, I can't say there's anything that just jumps out at me that the timing is perfect to go after this. I, I think there are opportunities. We've seen some on the East Coast where we're still identifying. I think there's still a lot to be looked at in sort of, in sort of the, the tuna swordfish industry. That's some fundamental changes need to be done to that part of the business that I think have some opportunities. Um, we, we looked also, and, and, and I've explored some areas around the, the New England ground fish business. I think there's some opportunities coming in there, but that's more of a vertical. You've got to be more vertically integrated to make that work. So again, I, I, when I look at all of these things, I, I, I look at each fishery separately because each one is a niche, and each one has goes to market differently, and each one has um, different regulatory requirements and different management styles that you've got to follow. And so to identify something right off the top of his head and say, well, that's where to go, um, it's a tough one. It's, it's really hard to find. Uh, again, what we try to look for is, is there a good resource? Um, you know, have, do you have good information on the resource? Has there been stock assessments, if you're looking at wild fisheries? Do you have, um, have certification in those fisheries? Are they sustainable? Uh, are there limited entries? And if not, will there be? The other things that we also look at is, in, is the current management system going to change and what's the opportunity for that? Or can you come in and make changes to a current management system that give that, give that industry a lot more efficiencies and, and take a lot more value out of it? Um, so there are some out there, but it, it, it's, it's a longer term play to make them happen. Let's talk about some of the pitfalls, um, in particular with uh, private equity investors. So we'll stick with you, Jeff. Um, obviously, as we said, Bragels, uh, the, the uh, executives there have been in the industry a long time. But what are some of the common pitfalls you have seen when you look at uh, either private equity investment or other outside investors coming into the sector? What are, what are some of the easy mistakes for them to make when it comes to seafood? They think a long term period is five years. Um, that would be the first one I would say. And, and it, it's just not in this business because it's not as predictable. Um, in a five year cycle, you could come in if you bought at the right time in the cycle. Within that five years, you could exit and do quite well. Um, but what we found often is that when private equity comes into the business expecting certain sort of reporting conditions, most of the companies that we bought, as they, again, said they're family-owned businesses, they don't have sophisticated accounting systems, they do not have sophisticated reporting systems, they do not even have the staff for that on, on, on staff, and you've got to develop that. And that's, that puts you immediately a year behind just trying to get that done. Then the next stage is identifying management for that operation, and how are you going to move it and transition it to a more strategic planning and getting 
the non-professional staff to start acting professional or changing that staff. This goes another year or two. And so you're just into three years really before you get your feet on the ground with the business. And now, you know, somebody starts talking about should we, you know, we want to sell it too. It's not enough time to really get, to extract the value out of the business. I think that's the biggest thing. The other part of it is, is to look at the different areas within the industry. Uh, for instance, when we look at the harvest sector, you know, I'm not going to take anything on in the harvest sector unless it's got at least a 25% EBTA possibility, you know, uh, and you're really looking at 25 to 45% at that level. When you get into the processing or marketing side of that business, that changes dramatically. You know, you're really looking at if you can pull out of that business 8 or 9% EBTA, that's pretty good on that part, that's part of the business. So, you, you've, your partners need to know that, they need to understand that, they need to know that the use of capital is going to be very different, um, and you really need to understand the working capital you need in these businesses. So, Shanta, let's talk a little bit about exits and when Rootstock has entered into the sector. I think we've talked before that your timeline is quite long. Um, but obviously you have to go in thinking about the exits. So where do you see for seafood industries um, and the investments Rootstock uh, has made? Do you see this going to major trade buyers? Do you see it going public? What's kind of the vision for where uh, seafood uh, businesses can go? Uh, I, I believe a lot of the, the, the supplier industries, especially in salmon farming, are they're fairly small. So for them to, to go IPO or do something like that, you need to do something dramatically like merger or, or something like that. Um, what I've experienced over the last few years is a, it's kind of a funny thing. Like I see all these big industrial conglomerates now showing up on their like seafood conferences and, and, and kind of like show face. So, uh, and I also see a lot of companies in the food industry in general uh, that had maybe a very small portion of the revenue stream from the seafood sector, they are seeing that, that that revenue stream is growing and they certainly start to look at that segment and suddenly they see what probably people in this room have already seen um, and start to, to make interest. So I had a lot of calls and, and talks with big uh, international industrial companies that wants to learn more about the sector and, and uh, I believe uh, we see different companies coming from from nowhere or, or different sectors jumping in they want a piece of this action going on here. We talked about that uh, earlier though as, as we saw uh, ABM on the stage we know that Cargill's been involved. Um, do you see some of these uh, larger agribusinesses getting more and more interested and do you see them stepping in with their checkbooks in the way that Cargill did and saying yeah I want to be in uh, aquaculture feed. We're going to see more of that. I think, I mean, you know, definitely agribusiness or sort of traditional, you know, grain merchants, um, you know, are looking at it and probably continue to do more. But I but also think the, the more kind of branded foods sector, uh, you know, I think if you look at companies that's got uh, big, big uh, uh, land based protein operations and, and with that uh, kind of a branded portfolio of products as well. I think some of those guys are definitely looking at seafood as a category that they're underrepresented in, and um, you know I think you could see some of those um, you know in the fray as well. Um, other than that, I think you you probably also have the possibility of of, of um, you know probably some strategic players coming in. Um, you know, obviously we've seen um, you know big state of Chinese companies doing. Big, big things on the agriculture side of things, so you know, security of supply of grains. But you know, if you have to sort of replicate that in the seafood space, I think you could, you know, see some of them come in with uh, fairly large um, checkbooks and you know, purchasing power as well. Same question to you, Christopher. Uh, will we start seeing some of these larger players coming in that we may not know about, may not be on our, our radar collectively, of those of us that are in the industry? Are we going to see more of those people pop in and get involved with just the stroke of a pen? So, uh, no, I, the, the answer is yes. We will see, see more, more companies coming in. And, and, and I think what, what Shetty just said they start called uh, companies which started to, to recognize that maybe they are called uh, 
have a small portion of, uh, of the revenue streams within, within seafood, but that's, that's an area where we really want to grow. Well, then there are other companies which want to enter with that, uh, do not have anything there today. And um, so now I, I think it's in that respect to, to see what happened and, uh, back in 2015 when the first uh, Cargill entered, uh, acquired Evans and then Sweat is uh, quite a pharma, both, both uh, acquisitions that call it high premium valuations. Uh, but these companies saw this as uh, as platform investments for, for them to, to grow within the wider uh, seafood space and hence uh, they're willing to, to pay pay this premium. So um, uh, if you will see that, call it uh, high profile transactions or, or, or um, probably there will be call it, um, <laughs> smaller ones because there's not that many, many companies uh, left which are, are uh, available. But, Yes, you will see uh, people coming in, there are people looking, uh, and uh, the challenge is to find the right uh, endpoints. So we do need to start wrapping up, unfortunately, uh, but I just want to go down the road uh, and ask uh, about where the smart money should go. So I don't want to give away all your secrets, Jeff, about where you're looking, but if everyone could just give an idea of if you're an investor coming from the outside, don't know anything about the industry. What should you be learning and where should you be looking to put that money? Sorry. Start with you. Um, well, if you look on the resource side, you, you need to take a couple things into account. One is that you're probably limited to how much you can grow that company because you're going to be capped by the size, the amount of the resource you can take. And in most resource plays, at some point, the governments have restriction on how much any single person can own. So that's one thing to consider. Um, you'll get high margins out of it, but you're capped on what you can do. The other side of it is if you want to go into the market, I think that there's going to be a lot of changes in the market side in the next couple of years. Um, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, that will come in value added and changes in, in product form. It's driven a lot by what the salmon industry is doing. I, I think a lot of other industries are going to tag on to that. So I think that that's an area to look. And, um, and look at some consolidation of those particular businesses. But you have to determine how you're going to build brand in that to get the equity out of that, that in the future. And I think that's key. Chet, same question. Yeah, I would, I would tell the investors that they have to learn that this is a very small industry. It's an early phase. There are a lot of family-owned companies, different culture, different companies. Uh, and uh, treat the industry that way and if I want to give them advice where to make the best I would say I put a lot of money into, into raw systems of course and I want to put more so suppliers to the raw industry would be, would be a very good uh, place to, to go in my view. David? I think um, you know cost inflation isn't really on the radar at the moment in fact it's you know we're sort of at a period of deflation on you know the cost side I'm you know specifically talking about faults and um, but I think cost inflation is going to come th through again. It's going to appear, you know, sometime in the future. And I think um, the smart money could be, you know, going on price investing in, in companies who can address the risk of cost inflation effectively. So you know, it's going to be the providers who's going to to you know help the farmers to to keep cost inflation under control. Christopher, yeah. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned that. Call them what, what, what the investors need to be aware of, what to do, to to look at. And I think one thing uh, which is, is important to 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 understand to to, to get to to, uh, to see it, is the call it, very different situation which is in the salmon farming industry today versus uh, five six years ago. Uh, and, and to be able to understand how this has gone from a call it a cyclical. Uh, Industry to to today be a supply constraint, um, and I would call it with, with companies or with production earning good good margins, and in the medium term, that there are not uh, that many things which can completely change that picture. So 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 to to understand the, how that has changed, that it's not that it will go back to to the um, to the it was uh, um, in short term. Um, then um, 
you can start to see how can you take advantage of that. Um, I think Carl Emil had some very good points in his presentation earlier. Uh, we said today maybe uh, the pricing is a bit challenging, um, but that might change. So there, there might be good entry points uh, that we let me uh, know. Uh, another thing is um, for for um, call it projects uh, solutions that that uh, can take advantage uh, of. of uh, of um, the situation of for, 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 for by pr producing in, in other ways we have uh, talked a lot about uh, land based farming today uh, and you know, I think that uh, Atlantic Safari has uh, had a great success for for, for the dairy investors um, how, how the, that uh, call it, the value of that company has developed all, over the past years that there will be more projects which will need to be financed uh, and where that weather entry point will be at quite a lower elevation than where that is at for us today. Um, so that, that's uh, one thing. And, and um, there will also be call it other projects uh, where um, there will be opportunity to, to farm salmon um, in a new way, which, which will have call it an attractive entry point, but also call it high risk. And one thing will that will be um, call it a new projects within offshore farming. Today you have called the salt have, uh, which have uh, has, um, its um, platform out there, but they'll call it. I think we'll see more projects coming out, and uh, where that could be also interesting um, projects to, to consider. Well, there you have it. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking the panelists with a round of applause. <laughs>